haven't changed that. Oh, start video. Start video. Hey, there you are. There you are. I like it. I, I love the. I love seeing gold records in the background. Or, you know, <laughs> whenever I interview, so I, I almost I saw some. I saw that Kiss was selling. Um, you can just get your name put on Kiss gold records right now. And right, almost, right, right. I saw that. I was almost tempted just so I can match people back here. But, <laughs> um. Anyway, how are you, man? I'm good, man. It's uh, you know, I've been adapting like everyone else. We right. got to do what you got to do. Yeah. And it, uh, yeah, for the most part, it's uh, it's it's an easier adaption for me because I've got so much work stacked up and more keeps coming in, which is crazy. You think people would be tightening things up and worried about when we're going to get back to normal. But I guess that's the good sign is everybody's looking towards, you know, going back to normality um, instead of freaking out and going, I better tighten up and, and see what tomorrow holds. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Tomorrow is our future. And um, once the thing is, you know, said and done, we get to move on. So yeah, I've been extremely busy. And so what are you doing? Are you doing sessions? Are you doing vocal lessons or what? Uh, no, um, I finished my solo album just before the Suns tour started. Cool. I finished this, the vocals anyway, but um, I was singing to the, 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 the initial demos that my, my co-writer, co-producer did all the music. So I was singing because I was literally under the gun uh, to get everything done before the tour started. I had to turn in all my vocals because he had to start recording everything else and mixing by the time we were finishing the European tour. So I didn't have much time at all after the TSO tour. Um, so I knocked out all the vocals, but it was literally 11 songs in 14 days after coming off a two month tour. Um, so my voice is a little shabby. It was a little fried and crispy and around the edges. Um, so I had coming back from the European tour gave, allowed me the time to dig back into the, um, into the vocals and some of the things that were bothering me that I sounded either haggard or tired or even that I wasn't too uh, crazy about my performances but it also allowed me the opportunity to go in and add and you know just kind of elaborate on some things there were, there were some things like oh my god thank god I have this time because I, I didn't hear this before now I heard it after living with the the, uh, the new mixes and everything so I got that out of the way finally well that's what I'm Obviously, hearing yeah. that's what I'm hearing is that everyone you know a lot of the musicians I'm talking to right now are saying you know this is all terrible, terrible and terrifying, but there's little silver linings and everyone's never had this yeah. much time to get what they need done. Absolutely. And, and on top of that, I was, uh, I, I got my, my keyboard player slash second guitar player in, uh, in Soto. I got him a solo deal mm. with Frontiers Records, but the contingency on, on that was that the guy that I just did my new solo record with, we had to write all the songs and we had to, we have to co-produce the record. So we were, while he was mixing and getting that going, he was also sending me songs and I was writing and singing to all the demos to get ready for BJ's album. Um, BJ's the guy in, my, in the band Soto. And then on top of that, we started the new Wet album. And then on top of that, I'm doing these jams with Brian May, the, you know, these isolation jams. These yeah, videos, I've seen those. A couple conferences. So it's been, I've been in my studios nonstop so much. I mean, I keep grabbing my arm here because I've got kind of a, like a tendonitis thing going on where because I'm constantly reaching over to the trackpad or the computer, I've done more sit down and computer work than I have in a concentrated time in the past six weeks that I've kind of, kind of got like a computer elbow, I guess the, te the equivalent to tennis right. elbow. I'm curious about the Brian May thing. Cause I saw the, we are the champions video. Um, yeah. What was that? Was that, a, I know that you have a history with the guys in queen. You were in, you know, the queen extravaganza tribute band and everything for a little while. And, you know, you're friends with those guys. So did they call you or, you know, how did that oh, come no. up? How? The funny thing is everybody thinks uh, that that was arranged by all of us. It, it, absolutely not. Brian's been doing these uh, challenge me, the, these kind of challenges where he'll play uh, like maybe two minutes of a Queen song on his Instagram. He'll just play it with the sound. He won't sing, He'll basically count you in. And he wants people to record themselves singing and playing along to him and posting it just for fun. You know, it's kind of like right. a pass the time away when you do those kinds of things. It's, it's like jamming with Brian May, so to speak. Because then Blabbermouth one, picked it up and they made it into like, oh, Jeff exactly. Scott Soto and Brian May are in a band together now. And who am I to go out there and try to correct people? But I'm, I'm telling right. you the truth here. Yep. So Brian put that out and then uh, Roger decided he wasn't going to get in. He wanted to get into the action. So I guess he picked up Brian's video and played along with the drums. So now all of a sudden everybody wanted to sing along with Brian and Roger. So I'd already done one for the song Hammer to Fall. There was a there was a, a, a project that a buddy of mine in, in Japan is an Australian guy. He, he pieced together Bumblefoot and Alex Goldnick, uh, Stu Ham, a, a bunch of famous friends of his 
including myself, to uh, to do a version of Hammer to Fall, kind of a funny video, et cetera. And uh, out of that, that's, you know, I, I, I was just part of that. I didn't want to do anymore. I wanted to keep, I didn't want to start making it look like I'm, I'm vying for the queen position, not at all. Right, I'm right. Kinda, I'm just kind of bored and in between and, uh, and, and wanted to be a part of that. So the, for the We Are the Champions That's thing, cool. they wanted to do that. They wanted to do a, another version of that video, but they wanted to make a serious one that uh, was going towards the first responders and the hospital staffs mm -hmm. around the world, et cetera. And I said, you know what? I, I'm going to back out of this. I'd rather not be a part of more and more Queen songs. It just looks like I'm, I'm trying to send the message, and, and, and I'm not. I'm just doing it for fun. But when I saw Roger getting in the mix, I'm like, oh, I want. I wish I'd done this with Roger in the first place. So, again, just for fun, just for my own pleasure, I decided to throw the vocals down. First, I, I downloaded the track because a, a buddy of mine in Brazil was just doing the same thing, playing along. He posted himself with them. I downloaded the track because I didn't want just the lead vocals. I wanted to have the big, elaborate Queen background vocals. And be, as you said, I was part of the Queen Extravaganza. I was privy to having the vocal stems for that song so i i knew all the parts i knew all the different stacks and harmonies and layers so it was fun for me to actually be able to do them all i threw those into the actual mix and then i played it back with everything together and i, I sang along to it all of a sudden it blows up this viral thing everybody thinks some that brian and roger called me to come and sing with them it's not at all it, 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 <laughs> in fact, they did one they did that exact song with adam lambert and Brian posted that. That's why he probably didn't post my version because they'd already done it with Adam. So again, well, Jeff, the the fact that you're at a position in your life where where you know you have an issue here because people think you're part of Queen now. That's a pretty good pretty good issue to have. <laughs> pretty good place hey, you know to what? be at in life. Again, I'm not going to go out there and correct anybody. I'll, right. I'll, I'll take the, the quick notoriety and the the validation, so to speak. Now, because you're friends with those guys, was there ever any possibility of you being in that position that Adam Lambert's in right now? And uh, you know. I can't go into the specifics um, and I don't want to go into anything that throws uh, a, a caution to the wind. Basically right. I can't really elaborate. There, there were discussions. Let's just put it this way. There was, there was a, a short little window of time that uh, before Adam, that there was a discussion and it didn't get any past that. So I'll just leave it at that. And uh, you know, I, I value my friendship and everything that I have with those guys so I'm not going to say anything to pat myself in the back just for, you know, for people to go, hey, yo, well, you should, you know, I, it's not necessary. Um, but to, to answer your question and to be honest and truthful about it, yes, there were inklings at one point and it just, it was, uh, it just didn't turn into anything. So. All right. Well, that would have been interesting. I mean, that would have been cool. Yeah. You, you do real well on the Queen stuff. You have a great I, You know what? I, I've said it many a time in interviews and uh, anybody that's asked me why I, pick on Queens so to speak so much. Um, Freddie and Steve Perry were, are, they're, they're part of my DNA. It's not, I'm not trying to be them. Uh, I'm just so influenced by their music and what they left behind uh, and their legacies. You know, th that's one of the reasons why I personally fit. So I thought I fit so well with Journey because even though I don't sound like Steve Perry, maybe I did when I was younger, when my voice was more, you know, when I was your age, I probably had more of a younger voice. By the time I started singing with them, I was older and huskier in, in terms of my delivery. So I, naturally, those two bands were something I could have, could have stepped into naturally without trying to emulate and trying to be a tribute version of them. You know, it's right. just, they, they, both, they both mean so much to what I do as a singer that uh, it was just a natural thing for me to be able to step into Journey. And it would have been just as natural to step into Queen. Now the journey thing always kind of confuses me a little bit. And I, you know, I had to go to like five different articles to even try to piece together a little bit of the story. But, um, and I think, you know, even you were confused about what happened at the end of your time in journey. Um, but then, you know, I started reading that in 2015, I think, you know, you ran into Dean, the former drummer of journey and you got to talk to him and ask him some things or, or whatever happened there. You know, was that the moment that you found out why you didn't go forward with journey? You, do you know even now why you didn't go forward with journey? I have a better sense of it than I had the past, uh, the, the past 10 years before I was able to sit with Dean. And again, I'm not going to throw Dean under, under, under the bus. He didn't tell me anything that was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that. It, there were things that I kind of thought could have been the issue. 
but uh, for the most part, it w as far as I'm concerned, it was unwarranted and it was invalid and it could have been resolved with a, a just a sit down, just a discussion. Um, if I was rubbing anybody the wrong way or, or vice versa, or if I said anything, or whatever, all I can tell you and anybody that asked me is I absolutely one trillion percent respected my position in that band. I did everything from uh, how I spoke to the guys, how I was around the guys, how I represented the guys, uh, how I res represented the legacy. Um, I made sure that I, I respected every aspect of it on the road. I Because I, I went with my band, I, I'm known to go have a few drinks and we can even drink on stage and get hammered and all that stuff. It's part of the show. It's, it's fun. But with Journey, I respected that that's not what that's about. I didn't even pick even so much as a beer on that tour because I just wanted to, I wanted my voice to be as full and as, as lush as it could for that catalog. I wanted to deliver every night and I respected their, the position that I was put in. They, they gave me that gig. I wanted to show them that I respected it enough to deliver and do my best with it every night. So across all those boards, I don't feel it was warranted. And, and in the end, I, I can't really say too much more about that because we, we do have an agreement between us that we don't talk about it uh, publicly. And, but I do have a little more insight as to what happened there. And it, 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 still, it still doesn't make sense to me, but it is what it is. We're what, uh, I was fired in 2007. So we're 13 years into it. It's, it's water under the bridge, it's history. Right, so it's not something that you think about much anymore. Not anymore. I mean, it would be, wonderful to be a part of the legacy to be included in the legacy like when they the the uh the rock and roll hall of fame thing uh past members former members were mentioned oh, the only other one you know there were two that weren't mentioned Tor uh, george tickner who was the one of the original second guitar players in the very early days of the band and the first album or first two albums and robert fleischman who was in the band you know, he was in there just for a, a minisecond, nanosecond before Steve Perry got the gig. Right. But other than that, it would have been nice to be recognized that I was part of that legacy. And, um, you know, I know it is. I, I know it's part of my legacy. I know what I did. I know what I was privy to. So in the end, uh, I'm, I, I'm just happy I, I got to do it. I got to sing those songs. You know, I got paid to sing those songs when I was doing them so many years and decades before for free. So <laughs> got to got to look at it, got to put a positive spin on it. And, and you do kind of become part of the legacy in a sense, because you still get called Jeff Scott Soto of Journey, even though you were only in the band for what, less than a year, was it? Uh, yeah, it was 11 and, months. Right. And so, um, you know, is that that's got to be kind of weird when people call you Jeff Scott Soto of Journey. Is it uncomfortable? Well, the only thing that stings is that there's no mention of it in their bio you know this i i'm not part of the uh like the website that talks about the band's history it basically went from perry to uh, jerry to pineda and i i was and i think i'm listed there for just a quick second like on wikipedia but it still lists me as the fill-in singer right. and that was only that was only true for the first six months that i was with them because i still to this day i, I have a copy a clipping that was pl plastered everywhere in December of 2006, where it said Steve Jerry is officially out of the band and Jeff Scott Soto is the new permanent lead singer of the band. That doesn't, you don't call me the fill-in. You don't call me the, the guy that's just kind of getting through the tour after the fact, after you say, after you, you dub me permanent lead singer of the band, where I was an equal member. I was an equal part of that band until the time they let me go. So that's the only thing that truly still bothers me and still stings that I can't, I can't just even prove, I can't say, yeah, you want to know that I was in the band? Open the band's website. It'll say I was their lead singer. It, it still shows me as a, as a fill-in position singer, as a hired gun. So do you think it would sting less if they hadn't used the word permanent? If you had just been out there, it would have been clear to everybody? Absolutely. Yeah? Because so that's even the if, I were, if I were permanent, but it wasn't mentioned to the public, then yeah, then I have nothing to stand on. But the right. fact that they they posted it and they made they put out a public statement, they they added to the the fact to that actual news, as well as I put out a little statement, and it was all part of like a press release that I was uh, their permanent singer now. So yeah, it would have if that never happened, it wouldn't bother me as much because again, I wouldn't have the legs to stand on as far as saying I was their permanent singer. But to actually have that from 2006 until May 2007, 
and then to kind of backpedal and say I was only a fill-in hired singer, it, it kind of, eh. So based it off sucks. of, <laughs> it, it totally sucks. And based off of your experience with those guys, do you think that fans should take caution, you know, when, because we only really have one side of the recent story that came out with the bass player and the drummer and Journey supposedly trying to overthrow, you know, Neil and Jonathan and take over the right. band. Do you think there's more than we we know about it from that story? Yeah, and you know what? In the end, I look at the overall scope of it as it really doesn't matter because in the end, the only thing that people care about with Journey is those songs, those legacy songs, and Steve Perry. In their eyes, whether I was a, an official guy, whether I was there as long as Arnell has or as long as Jerry was, everybody's still replacing Steve Perry and he's the only big news. He's the only big talk that comes out of talking about Journey. So I'm not going to sure. sit, sit here and cry over spilled milk. Yeah. It, it, this is just a personal thing for me. I don't necessarily, I don't need this for my resume to go around saying I sang for Journey. I'm doing fine. <laughs> I, I did all right for myself afterwards. I did all right for myself before. And I don't necessarily need the validation uh, that I was their permanent lead singer. I was a band member, part of the band to continue my career and continue my life. It's, you know, even when I talk about Journey or hear about Journey, again, the only thing I really care about is Steve Perry in, the, in that equation. Right. And, and so it's an honor enough that you were, you know, you got to fill those shoes. Exactly. Of one of your exactly. idols. It's like and, and, and no no regrets, you know. I, I usually get that question in in most interviews. Do you have any regrets in your career? And the answer to that is one thousand percent no, because without a bad or a good experience, you don't know what that experience would have or could have been, and you learn from them. If you have a bad experience, you can't regret it because you learn something from it. If you have a good experience, you learn something from it. So there's no regrets. Well, it seems like you're having a pretty good experience in Sons of Apollo right now. Um, you, you know. Does joining a band like Sons of Apollo, where you're with all those other guys, Bumblefoot, Mike Portnoy, the fan bases are kind of spilling over, do you think it's given you kind of a new level or, a, you know, I don't know, a, kind of brought on a new wave of fame, new wave of fans, in a sense, joining that band? Yes and no, because for the most part, Sons of Apollo fans are Sons of Apollo fans. Sure, we, we're filtering over our own personal fans, but there are a lot of fans of Portnoy's who truly only like him doing the really proggy stuff, not the metal proggy stuff like like we're doing with Sons of Apollo. Mm -hmm. um, Billy Sheehan's fans, they really like him more in the Mr. Big Winery Dogs level and arena of things. Yeah, this um, is heavy for Billy. Yeah, exactly. For mm -hmm. Bumblefoot, he's got his own niche that he's been doing for many, many years, aside of what he did for Guns N' Roses. Again, most people equate Guns N' Roses to Slash, so... Ron doesn't get the credit that he deserved for even the Chinese democracy era because it, it, for all intents and purposes, they, a lot of people didn't like that record. They thought it was, it sounded more like an Axl Rose record. Right. So we have, we have a few of our diehards that follow us through everything, but I haven't really gained any new fans from say Mike Portnoy's 1.4 million Facebook fans. Right. My, my numbers haven't moved considerably or, or much at all since I joined Sons of Apollo, which goes to show that there's even some of my own fans who don't like it. They don't like when I'm singing that style. They prefer me singing more the AOR, the journey wet kind of stuff that I'm, I was known for the big bulk of my career. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, it's, it's not really a big crossover of, of, new, of a new fan base. It's, it's the crossover is only really occurring on people who like Sons of Apollo. And we're still building that audience. We're still making that audience which is our own, something that, that we can actually call our own instead of having to rely on our past recognizances for uh, our past cognizance for the, uh, uh, the other stuff that we've done or that they know us for. Right. And, and what about the personalities? Because I mean, that's a factor. You're, you know, you're not going on tour with a hungry band of amateur musicians trying to make it big. You guys have all made it big. You guys have all toured before you have stories from the road, you know, um, do you guys, is it awkward at all at first? You know, how do you guys kind of adjust to becoming used to just touring all together now? Yeah, in the beginning, it was, it's always weird with a new band. It was even, it's even weird with an old band when you're going out with a new record because you have to, when you're starting a tour, you have to find your legs on that tour. You have to find the, that kind of sweet spot, that comfort zone. Um, obviously, you, if you already have that with guys you're familiar with, then that you just have to worry about, 
the music and the set list settling in. When, when you're going out with personalities that you, you, I've known Billy Sheen for over 30 years, but I don't know him on stage. I don't know his persona on stage. I don't know him backstage. I don't know what he's like to coexist with daily. And the same with the other guys. I've known right? for, a, yeah, I've known for a long time. Ron was the, the one I knew the least. So yeah, you have to learn each other's habits, what, what each other expects, what, you know, are they private people? Are they loud? Are they quiet? Are they, you know, you learn all those things. I'm more of a chameleon. I do keep to myself, but for the most part, I, 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 I like to fit in more than I, I, because I don't want to upset people. I'm always constant. I'm always consciously thinking, uh, I don't want them to think I'm rude or, or uh, invasive of their space or, <laughs> so I'm always right. thinking of my own kind of like, look on the outside looking in just making sure that i i find my place within a situation and you have to do with that with everything with with the onstage performances i'm used to saying and doing what i normally do with my bands doesn't necessarily work with sons of apollo some things do work and so yeah you find that alteration and you find that customization for that band and for the first tour it took us a few weeks to finally get there for this up for this recent tour it took us a few days because at that point we already had we already broke that ground uh, on the first tour. And the second tour, it was more, like I said, it was more or less gelling with the material and making sure everything flowed from one song to the next and, and making it feel loose and comfortable and, and that it didn't look like work. And now at this point, a few years into the band, do you have someone, you know, that's a closest friend in the band or is, are you just kind of, you know, good with everybody? The, I confide to and with all of them it, for se separate things for separate reasons and issues and but i i find i have as equal a friendship with all of them yeah it's i again like i said i've known billy the longest we've known each other over 30 years we we toured together when i was singing for ingvay malmstein back in 85 and his band talus was opening for us before he got the david lee roth gig so i've known billy for 35 years now uh, again, that doesn't mean that we are the best of friends. We we didn't have we didn't hang in the same social circles, and we we're both so busy. He was always on tour with Dave or Mr. Big, or, or now recently with Winery Dogs. It wasn't until we got to actually do this sitting in this setting to finally truly know each other. So I would have to say Billy just just on the the default of the amount of years that we've known each other. Interesting. Uh, now, the, the the one thing I haven't talked to you about this interview yet, and you know, you got to hit all the essentials of every interview, and, and the essentials of a Jeff Scott interview, of course, or Jeff Scott Soto interview, of course, are the journeys, the Ingve Malmsteins, and you know, whatever you're doing now. So um, I haven't talked about Ingve yet. And by the way, there's audio out there of the first time I ever actually pronounced Ingve's name, and I, I was like, <laughs> Yoingi Malmsteen, or so. I was like ten. Exactly. Um, and that's, that, that's actually the closest. <laughs> yeah. Closer than most people the first time. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It was. It was a Ron Keel interview, and I was. You know, okay. I just went over it as fast as I could. I was like, uh, gotcha. when you played with Yoingi. Um, but I'll tell anyway. you before you ask that question, I'll tell you a, a quick little funny anecdote. Yeah. Uh, when I first started with Ingve, you know that that was back in the the early 80s or mid 80s when everybody was coming out with stage names i mean stage names have been around for the since the, the, the early dawn of man right but um during the 80s you know people like vince neal and nikki six everybody was changing names to these cool stage names and i go oh, jeff scott soto my god that sounds it sounds so ethnic it sounds so not rock and roll so to to not completely go away from the form of my name i was just going to shorten it to jeff scott and I, when we did the first thing they album, I said, hey, hey, before you put the uh, the information, turn it into the record company. I'm thinking of changing my name to just Jeff Scott. And then Ingve looked at me and goes, whoa, are you crazy? Jeff Scott Soto, man, that's a cool rock name. I, I wouldn't change it. And I, and I was so like, oh, duh, duh, duh. I was like 18 years old. Right. You know, <laughs> and, and I just said, I basically just said, yeah, you know what? Maybe Ingve's right. If, if he's telling me I should keep it, I should keep it. And it wasn't until years later I realized I just took advice from a guy named Ingve Malmstein. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Well, so, you know, it would have been a nice I'm, I'm, it would have been a nice contrast to have Ingve Malmstein and then just Jeff Scott under it, you know? Yeah, you know, I'm little. glad I did it. I'm I'm glad I was able to keep my family name intact, especially yeah. now. It's uh, you know, the the whole Soto clan are so they're just so proud that uh I put our name into the the public forum around the world like that because right. especially a name a name like Soto is it's it's very ethnic in the sense of Spanish, 
and around the world most most of the time for the most for all intents and purposes the name soto would have been for a latino artist you know it would have been for somebody doing something like uh, despacito not not you know stand up and shout <laughs> right right <laughs> no it, i can't imagine you as just jeff scott you're jeff scott soto and it, well, it works yeah it, yeah it, well clearly it, you know i'm not gonna do any changes 35 years after yeah right That'd be something. Well, anyway, the, the question, you know, first of all, when was the last time you've actually, you actually sat down and had a conversation with Ingve? Because it seems like most of the stuff that's gone back and forth between you guys has just been through the press over the last decade or so. The last conversation, I think I saw him at the NAM show and all, all the way from the time I left, and that from was the time when? I started with him to the time I left, um, until say 2006, 2007. I, I wanna say the last time I saw him was when I was still living in England and he was playing and I went to go see him and you know we were always friends. We we're always uh, very friendly with each other. We didn't call each other and, and hang out on the phone all the time, but I would call him on his birthday or just reach out to him. And uh, if he was in town, I'd go see him. And I wanted to retain that friendship but in 2009, when the bass player from Talisman, who's my dear friend Marcel Jacob, yeah. took his own life, now Marcel cut his teeth with Ingve back in, you know, they were just teenagers back in Sweden. They'd known each other that long. Um, and Marcel was part of the first incarnation of, of the international Ingve Malmsteen's Rising Force than when I, was, when I was the singer. So that's where, where Marcel and I had met. And from there, Talisman was spawned. But, um, the fact that they had so much history together and they had a falling out years prior to before uh, prior to uh, Marcel killing himself. Um, uh, they had a division and a wedge between them that was not repairable. Unfortunately, Ingbe held on to that. And when Marcel took his life, I was hoping that like everybody else that knew him and loved him, were just going to come. They're going to, what any, whatever the issues were, between anybody that they would just let them go. Now they would just show respect and pay respect to the fact that he's gone. And unfortunately, Ingve decided to just disappear and just not want to be bothered with it. Wouldn't answer the phone, wouldn't be part of any statements, any, any part of Marcel's life. And it kind of bummed me out that, at that time. It, it, it pissed me off more, more so. And it got me to the point where I'm like, you know what? I even said something that ended up in the unauthorized book uh, the Ingve Malmsteen book, where it said, as far when Ingve did this, as far as I'm concerned, Marcel was dead and Ingve was dead in my mind. So I guess the way it was worded, I guess it probably would have gotten back to them. And then the the icing on the cake was one time I was just doing one of these Throwback Thursday postings on social media. I took a a clipping from when I joined him on stage in 2000 or something like that to go sing "I'll See the Light Tonight." And I, it was recorded on my camera, my, my video camera. I, I own the, the footage. I just posted it just for fans, just to say, you know, this was back then. It was cool. You know, we hadn't seen each other in a while. I got to go sing with them, blah, blah, blah. Paying my respects, paying homage to, tribute to what we did. And I got a, a, a cease and desist from his attorneys, you know, saying this is uh, the property of Ingve Malmsteen and it's a publishing copyright uh, infringement. And I'm like, hold the phone. It's not, the property is mine. The, the clip is recorded from me. I didn't take it from him and try to use it. Second, I co-wrote the song. My name is as, as an author on the publishing for that song. It's, he doesn't own it 100%. Right. So it's not a copyright infringement. I'm putting it on there because I'm a part owner of that song. I co-wrote the song. And there was a back and forth. And basically that, that's what I, I just, I let my feelings get the best of me. And uh and I put a post that basically showed the, the famous Johnny Cash middle finger. <laughs> and, and I just said, you know, F you to the, the whole Malmsteen organization for that. Oh. Again, I was acting on impulse. And most people, when they're younger and when they're not thinking clearly, they act on impulse. And I, I regret doing that or anything that puts me in a negative light with them. And I've said it recently, and I'll continue saying it. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm 54 now. Uh, we're all getting older. Uh, our heroes are going to start, they've already started dying. They've already right. started leaving us. More of them are going to be going soon because they're older than us. And that just means we're next. The, the people that were my colleagues and my peers and the ones I work with, I don't want to go, I don't want to leave this earth with any of that stuff 
still lingering. I, I, I want peace and harmony and respect with and for one another. So I just said, I'll never say anything negative about my time or about Ingbe or about anybody in Journey, et cetera, from this point on, because mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, that's my olive branch that I'm extending out. I, I wanna just be peaceful and friendly with everybody and let's just get along because we don't have that much time left in this earth. So did you reach out to Ingve at all after that time? There's not, there's nowhere to really reach out to. Um, you got to send uh, a, a I, I don't have a pigeon. phone number. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go through a third party. Like, Hey, can you send this to his booking agency to tell his right. roadie to telling it, you know, if I put it out there enough publicly, it'll get to him. And if he decides to not act on it, then that's fine. That's what he's decided. But this is what I've decided to do. And at least on my end, I can walk away with a piece of not continuing to bash or just to, to say nasty or negative things about him, especially in the press. So as far as I'm concerned, it's water under the bridge. And I hope someday we'll be sitting in, the, you know, sharing a dinner and, and just talking about the old times again, like we used to. Well, you know, have you tried a, an owl or a carrier pigeon? I feel like somehow that would get to him. I feel like somehow it would end up wherever he is, it would get to him. Telling people like you and, and just sharing it whenever I feel it or deem it necessary. That's my olive branches right there. And that right. goes towards that goes towards anyone in journey that goes towards uh, anybody that I might have. I don't really have any really bad positions or cross, you know, crossing paths with people in the, it, that I have to worry about or think about. The, those two are the only two that I try not to let it bother me because I'm just a peaceful, loving guy. Right. And I don't want any of that water into the bridge to, to remain there. You know, I just, I just want it to be over. I want it just to be happy and peaceful and friendly again. And that's how it should be. I mean, and you know, especially in this time, who, who knows, it's, it's a crazy time. Right. And, you know, um, Jeff, like I, I said a little bit, or I, I messaged it to you, but you know, I have, um, I have, I, taking college classes over zoom right now. So I got to get going yeah. to, to one of those things. But I mean, I love talking to you, man. It's crazy that it was just two months ago that, you know, we were at your show in Boston. I know, and, right? And we were allowed to, you know, be within six feet embrace of each other. And embrace spit and spit on each other. <laughs> right. The whole thing. There was that, you know, that guy was able to just walk right up onto stage oh and sit down on, on Mike's uh, drum riser. Oh my God. I was standing right next to that guy. I mean, I saw security's face. They just, he, he was already at the drum riser when you know they looked at each other and they were like wait a second you know at first i thought it was one of our techs trying to fix a microphone or something so i, I didn't even pay any attention to it and then i went who the hell is this guy right and then it, then it dawned on me that i'm thinking who the hell is this guy but yet nobody's doing anything about it and that's dangerous you know portnoy was really really angry and upset about that that night because he's he was very friendly he was he was good friends with uh dime bag daryl and that's, that's what, exactly yeah that's what comes that's to everybody's kind of situation mind. Yeah, right? that you have yeah. to worry about somebody just like that coming up on stage and being allowed and having that free access like that. That guy should have been pounced before he put one foot up. But he yeah. sat there and having his drink and like, hey, uh, okay, what's going on here? I'm not a naturally violent person, so I wasn't going to take him and throw him off the stage or try to hurt him or hurt somebody else in the process. But it should have been nipped in the bud. But yeah, that was that was weird. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Yeah, and I, so I, I mean, everyone seemed shook by it. So it's clearly not something that happens every night. Right, right, right. Yeah, interesting. Hey, Jeff, um, I wish you all the best during this time, man. I mean, how can right people, on, um, how can people keep up with what you're doing, and you know, just keep in touch with you through this time? Well, the JeffScottSoto.com is probably the place that has the least amount of traffic these days, because obviously social media took over right. uh, personal sites. So any of my social media on Instagram, uh, Twitter, or Facebook, and if it doesn't have the blue badge, don't even Ain't follow. Real. Don't even bother. Uh, right. I was lucky enough to get those uh, those blue badges, and if if it don't have the blue badge, don't don't open it. <laughs> it's right. it's just somebody with either old or false or crappy information that it's it's not what's happening. Right. Awesome. Cool, Jeff. Thank you so much again. You're the man. Right on, Miles. Thanks. All right. I'll talk to you later. Later. Peace.